Good evening. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the Emeritus Professor of Astronomy at Foothill College. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to this special lecture in the 24th season of the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures. For those of you who watch regularly, you'll see that the background is a little bit different. And that's because the building in which the Smithwick Theater, where we usually hold the lectures, is located, is being renovated. So we're going back to a virtual uh, setting for the next few lectures, but we very much welcome you to tune in uh, via this uh, virtual method uh, for the upcoming lectures. And we're glad you're here, whether you're watching us live or watching the recording on YouTube or the uh, a podcast, listening to the podcast, we welcome you. The Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures are a series of public programs going on for 24 years now, jointly sponsored by the Foothill College Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Division, by the SETI, or Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, and by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And we very much welcome their support. Before I introduce tonight's lecture, let me give you a couple of procedural notes. Um, first of all, uh, we are going to have questions at the end. Dr. Halpern has very kindly agreed to, to answer questions. And so uh, if you have a question in this virtual format, the way to submit it is to use the email address astronomy at foothill.edu. So foot and hill in one word, astronomy at foothill.edu. And we'll flash that up during the talk a couple of times as well. At the end of the uh, lecture, we're going to be collating and asking all the questions that we receive, or as many as we have time for. We also want to remind you that if you uh, like uh, these lectures, we encourage you to uh, make an official like of it and to subscribe on YouTube. Uh, and if you want to be notified of future lectures, YouTube now requires that you hit the bell symbol when you register. So we ask you to do that as well. Um, uh, now, uh, let's get to tonight's talk. Um, uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. Paul Halpern. Uh, Dr. Halpern is professor of physics at St. Joseph's University and the author of 18 popular books on science. These include Time Journeys, The Great Beyond, The Quantum Labyrinth, and The Edge of the Universe. Dr. Halpern is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Fulbright Scholarship, and an Athenaeum Literary Award. He has appeared on numerous radio and television shows, including Future Quest, Science Friday, and my favorite, The Simpsons 20th Anniversary Special. He's also been on the C-SPAN book TV uh, show uh, about his various books. Uh, his most recent book is called The Allure of the Multiverse, Extra Dimensions, Other Worlds, and Parallel Universes, just published, and I have a copy of it here, just published by Basic Books. And we were very intrigued by the idea of this book, and we asked Dr. Halpern to tell us more about the allure of the multiverse in both science and popular culture. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me to introduce now Dr. Paul Halper. Thank you so much, Andrew, for your kind introduction. I'm truly honored to be part of the Silicon Valley lecture series. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the multiverse, which is a bit of a controversial topic, especially because does it make sense to look beyond observable things? After all, the scientific method involves observation. So I think I will demonstrate in this talk that it might make sense under certain circumstances to look beyond observable things. So I um, wanted to start by uh, talking a little bit about the goal of the scientific method, which is test and retest and verify using direct measurements. That's the time-told scientific method. And I think we all agree that if you can test things directly, that's the best way to conduct science, if you can do it. 
So for example, back in 1928, the great British physicist Paul Dirac came up with a, an equation to describe electrons and similar particles. And uh, it, it obeyed special relativity, it obeyed the laws of quantum physics, but he was perplexed because he found a set of solutions to his equations that were something like positive electrons instead of negative electrons. And he thought, well, maybe this could be a proton, but the mass wasn't right. Finally, he concluded it was something like an electron, only positive, which ended up being called a positron. And um, that was his theory. And then four years later, Carl Anderson, great physicist from Caltech, discovered the positron and uh, in, in uh, cosmic ray uh, data. And uh, that was a verification of Dirac's hypothesis in a beautiful way. And that was a really great example of the way we expect science to work traditionally, come up with a theory and then uh, then develop an experiment to observe, to test the theory, retest it, or conversely, uh, come up with experiment, find something odd in the experiment, and then come up with a theory and then test the theory. So that is the time told scientific method. Now in astronomy, direct observation is ideal. And that's why people are so excited about the James Webb Space Telescope and all the things it is revealing about, for example, uh, galaxy formation and the surprising fact that you have uh, galaxies that are fully formed well before we thought they would be around, way back in the past of the universe. And uh, this, this raises a lot of questions about our models of galaxy formation and the models of cosmology. And that's all due to uh, directly observing photons from the distant past of the universe. Yet, we have to admit that astronomy has its limits. And one limit is the boundary of the observable universe. We can't see everything in the actual universe. We can only see out to 46 billion light years in radius. Now, some of you might be surprised by the number 46 billion, because after all, uh, the, the concordance model of the age of the universe says that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. That might be somewhat up for grabs with new observations of dark energy, but still that's a far cry from 46 billion. Well, that number comes in from the fact that not only is the universe expanding, but it is accelerating its expansion. So as the universe is expanding faster and faster, galaxies that were once relatively close are now much, much farther away. Therefore, we know they're there, and, but they could be much further than, um, than, than 13.8 billion light years away because they've since uh, they've since moved far away because of the cosmic expansion and cosmic acceleration. I like to think of it as a little bit like if somebody throws a football to you and they're standing still, you can kind of figure out how far away they are by knowing the speed of the football and, um, and figuring how far they could throw it. But if they throw a football to you and then they run at top speed away from you, then they're much farther than you would estimate by just uh, talking about the speed of the football. You would have to also know their running speed, and that adds a lot greater distance to it. So that's why the observable universe is so big. But still, 46 billion light years is, uh, is insignificant compared to the possibility of an endless cosmos or infinite universe, as some theoretical models suggest. For example, Einstein's general theory of relativity, which was his brilliant model of gravitation, makes very expansive predictions that are far beyond observability. For example, um, when you look at general relativity, you need to talk about 
the shape of space. So uh, there are three possibilities. If the universe is isotropic, meaning that it expands the same in all directions, if that's the case, then there are three isotropic uh, solutions. One is the equivalent of a sphere, but in a higher dimension called a hypersphere. One of them is the equivalent of a uh, hyperbola, but uh, it's actually a hyperboloid, which is something like a potato chip sh shape. And then the third option is a flat universe, which is what, is what most cosmologists believe. And are we going to say that a flat universe just stops? And just like the, the old fashioned models of the edge of the earth, where you go a certain distance and then there's just uh, sea monsters and other creatures and there's nothing there. Well, nobody really believes that. If, it, if the universe is flat and extends uh, in all directions, uh, kind of in a straight line, uh, why wouldn't it continue far beyond the observable universe? So that's an area where cosmologists are very comfortable talking about something beyond observability. They'll say that the actual universe is flat and continues endlessly. Um, forever is a pretty strong word, but you can imagine it continuing far beyond the extent of the observable universe. Another famous solution to Einstein's general relativity is the idea of a black hole and which you can map out not just the exter exterior of the black hole, but you can predict what would happen in the interior of a black hole. And you can connect the two solutions, the exterior and interior, and have a model for what would happen if an astronaut, for example, traveled inside the event horizon of a black hole and tried to signal from the inside of a black hole. Well, nothing would escape, uh, no signals. Uh, eventually, according to Hawking radiation, a very slow trickle of radiation would uh, escape from the black hole. But nothing like a signal uh, yet, nor uh, you know, an astronaut couldn't escape from the black hole. So all theories about the interior of a black hole are speculation. Yet um, many astronomers and physicists feel very comfortable talking about what happens in the interior of a black hole. They don't say, oh, it's not measurable, so let's not talk about it. They talk about things that we can never observe. Uh, likely never observe, I should say, like beyond the observable universe, the interior of a black hole. So there are a lot of things that we can never know. We we can't map out currently the entire interior of Earth. We don't know. No one has, has gone to the core of the Earth. We can speculate. We can try to probe it as much as we can. But there are a lot of areas in science where we need to infer we need to extrapolate. We need to say, well, we know what we can observe. And based on that, we strongly suspect this is what happens beyond the observable boundary. Now, Hollywood has a field day with physics, which is very speculative, and astronomy, which is very speculative. So around the early 1970s, that's when People like John Wheeler started talking about black holes and their event horizon, and there were popular books on the subject. And that inspired Disney in the late 1970s to have a um, epic movie, The Black Hole, um, which, um, which kind of described what would happen if uh, astronauts led by uh, somebody who was uh, very... Uh, impetuous and very daring uh, toward the toward the interior of a black hole. And uh, what happens, according to Disney, is that the black hole is a hellish landscape where you're punished for your sins and and, uh, you know, more like the idea of an inferno than um, what any scientist would suggest. And it was a very uh, a strange movie. Uh, all speculative and really nothing to do with actual black holes. Similarly, 
a lot of the Hollywood movies about multiverse models have very little to do with science. And that um, currently, for some scientists, taints the idea of a multiverse. But I would say it really shouldn't, um, just like we can distinguish between the Hollywood version of a black call and the scientific version of a black call. We should be able to distinguish between the Hollywood version of a multiverse and the scientific version of a multiverse. And in fact, there have been lots of movies recently with fictional multiverse depictions. Uh, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, a Marvel movie, a uh, series of Spider-Verse movies, Into the Spider-Verse, Across the Spider-Verse, and then the Oscar-winning film from last year, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. And these were very popular films award-winning films in the case of Everything Everywhere All at Once. And yet the de multiverse depictions in that ha really had nothing to do with science. They were more like what we imagine, uh, what would happen if we could see alternatives in our lives. And I think that is the great appeal of multiverse models to the general public is first of all, the idea of probing beyond frontiers. And we're always curious to know what lies beyond the observable. But even more importantly, there are a lot of what if questions about what would happen if we made different choices in our lives. So, you know, if we had um, a choice between uh, living in uh, San Francisco and taking one job or moving to LA and taking a different job, what would happen to our lives if we made those uh, location choices? What would happen if we chose a different career? What if we, um, if in one universe, we, um, we gave up our ambition to form a rock band and we were very musical, but we ended up being an accountant. But then if we could see a different version of reality in which we stayed in the rock band and the rock band became very famous, internationally famous, maybe that would have been a better choice. So we never know. And also with, you know, who we take on as partners and friends in relationships, um, these are all things that we wonder about. What if we made different choices in life? So that's the public appeal of the multiverse. And a lot of things are not too obvious. For example, if you catch a train and you just make it, you're running to the train, you just hop on right before the train leaves. You think, wow, I'm so lucky I just made the train. But what would happen if that very train was in an accident or something bad happened? You would have regretted making the train and you might have thought, well, wow, I really should have missed that train. And it could turn out that this next train, you wait an hour for the next train and the partner of your dreams, your future partner was was on that train or uh, you meet a very good friend there or some career opportunity. So you never know. And that's why the idea of being able to see alternative branches of time, alternative realities in our life is so exciting. But as I'll show, that has very little to do with the scientific multiverse. And this is, a, this is a prime example of a multiverse movie which talks about alternatives, sliding doors, where the lead character just makes a subway train in one branch of reality and just misses the subway train in another branch of reality. And in the one where she just makes the train, she catches her partner uh, cheating on her and changes her life around. And in the one where she just misses the train, she doesn't. Uh, catch her partner um, cheating and she stays with her partner for a long time and uh, her life is kind of miserable for a while and then I'm not going to give too much away but there's a twist at the end uh, to, which calls into question the idea of which reality was better for her so that that's a really fine example of a multiverse movie and by the way I have an article if you google it um, the top 10 multiverse films, in my opinion, uh, of all time. So if you're interested in my opinion of multiverse movies, I have an article out there about that very topic. 
But how about science? Um, do we say that going beyond the observable should be taboo in science? Or do we accept the fact that sometimes there might be enclaves that are not directly observable, but could still be part of a theory? So let's look a little bit at the history of that idea, the history of the idea of enclaves beyond the observable. And the story begins with Albert Einstein, as so many things begin with the work of the brilliant physicist Albert Einstein. And in one of his last talks in 1954, um, so 70 years ago, um, Albert Einstein gave one of his last talks, and that was about um, problems in quantum physics. He was invited by Princeton physicist John Wheeler to speak to his relativity class, which was the first relativity class at Princeton. And here we have a picture of Einstein, Hideki Yukawa, the great Japanese physicist, and John Wheeler chatting um, in Princeton. And in the talk, Einstein addressed one of his many beefs he had with orthodox quantum interpretation. So famously, Einstein said, God should not roll dice. That was one of his statements about quantum physics, but he had a lot of other qualms about quantum physics. And one of them had to do with the idea of observation. So in orthodox quantum mechanics, which is sometimes called the Copenhagen interpretation, which was formalized by the Hungarian mathematician, John von Neumann, and, and was based on the philosophy of Niels Bohr, a quantum system is separate from human beings. And a quantum system is like a black box that you don't really know the inner workings. So we know our reality, which is a classical reality, the world of human beings, things like we bounce a ball, we know it's how high it's gonna go and so forth. In other words, Newtonian physics. But then quantum physics is a completely different beast and we only know about it by taking observations. So every time a researcher chooses a property to measure, according to von Neumann, the quantum state divides into an array of possible outcomes, like coming up with a drawer or a box and putting in lots of dividers in order to sort something out. And in this case, what is sorted out is the probability of being in different positions or the probability of being at different speeds. So before a quantum state is measured, it has uh, a lot of different components. And those are a little bit like these compartments in a box. And each of them is the probability of being in a certain position or probability of having a certain speed. And all you know are the probabilities. Then you take a measurement and miraculously, somehow, by taking the measurement, the box collapses down to one of the possibilities. And then um, you know that it's particularly at one position or particularly at one speed. But somehow the box knows to divide either into position possibilities or speed possibilities or possibilities of some other property based upon the intent of the measurer. So somehow it knows the measurer's setting up an experiment of a certain quantity, and then that's exactly what um, is going to be um, sorted. And one strange thing about it is this space of possibilities, which von Neumann called Hilbert space after the mathematician David Hilbert, can have an unlimited number of dimensions. And this calls to mind Hilbert's famous analogy of a hotel with an infinite number of rooms. So if you go up uh, to the, uh, the manager of the hotel and you say, um, your hotel has a no vacancy sign, I need a room, they might say, well, don't worry about it. Even though we have no vacancy, we can move the person from room one to room two, person from room two to room three, person from room three to room four, and create a vacancy. And then if somebody else comes along and says, hey, I'm a general, 
and have all these soldiers, in fact, an infinite army of soldiers, and we all need rooms. And the hotel manager once again says, no problem. Even though we have a no vacancy sign lit up, we can put all the people into odd rooms. So person in room one stays there. The person in room two goes to room three. Person in room uh, three goes to room five, etc. And then we can clear up all the even rooms for the soldiers. So now we have an infinite number of rooms. So that's what quantum space is like. Weirdly enough, it has room for every possibility. So if an electron has an infinite number of possible positions, then there are an infinite number of components in the Hilbert space. And then you take a measurement and somehow that infinite number of possibilities just immediately goes to one. So it's human choice that causes collapse. Well, Einstein was baffled by this. He believed in objective reality, believed reality should be out there. An electron should have a position. A, it should have a speed. And it shouldn't take a measurer to reveal these things. Um, they should be out there. Maybe we don't know what they are, but they're still out there. And he said in his talk at Princeton, um, I wonder if a mouse could trigger a quantum measurement. If a human being can, why not a mouse? And everybody laughed. And someone in the audience, a young physicist, Hugh Everett III, um, who is a physicist, young physicist from, from Washington, D.C., said, um, wow, this is really baffling. Quantum physics has a lot of problems. And he started to work on the question of reforming quantum physics and getting rid of this strange fact of the human observer. Now, note this is a picture of Hugh Everett in his 30s. He was in his 20s at the time of the lecture, but I couldn't find a a solitary picture of him in his 20s. And Everett said, what if collapse never happens? So if an electron has all these possibilities, all these possible states, it still remains in a mixture of all these possibilities. So this carton never collapses. You have all these possibilities. But then when an observer takes a measurement, that observer's conscious existence divides into all these possibilities, it branches. So in one possibility, an observer sees the electron maybe one nanometer to the left of a mark. Another, the observer sees an electron one nanometer to the right of a mark. And a third uh, version of the same observer might see it right on the mark. And each of those observers is convinced that they are right and goes on life thinking, that the electron was measured at a different position and they can't communicate with each other. They don't experience a branching. They don't experience a splitting. And the only difference between uh, all of them is different measurements of the same electron. Now, John Wheeler um, took on Hugh Everett as a student and he had recalled an earlier idea by Richard Feynman called Some of Her Histories that an electron in going from one place to another can interact many different ways simultaneously. And that actually has become uh, canonical physics, standard physics, that if an electron, if two electrons are interacting, for example, they might interact in many different ways at once. That's called sum over histories. So there's some resemblance between the two theories. And also there's a resemblance with fiction. The great um, Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges wrote a short story, The Garden of Forking, Forking Paths, imagining reality constantly splitting between all these possibilities. Now, Everett's hypothesis is in a way more extreme than Feynman's because Feynman's imagined the sum of our histories happening behind the scenes, but once you actually take a measurement, you only see one reality. So reality is a blending of possibilities, but you never see the different possibilities. Whereas in Everett's hypothesis, reality actually splits. So each 
version of an observer, each branch of an observer actually experiences a different reality. So it seems more like the universe itself is splitting at that point. And there's the famous uh, Schrodinger's cat thought experiment where you put a cat in a box with a, a vial of poison and a nuclear sample. And if the nuclear sample decays, the vial of poison is released. And if the nuclear sample doesn't decay, the poison is not released. In the first case, the cat dies. In the second case, the cat is spared. And the paradox is that until you open the box and take an observation, just like the sample would be in a state mixture of decayed and not decayed, the cat would be in a zombie-like mixture of alive and dead until you open the box. Now, Everett would say, that's nonsense. It's either alive or dead, but um, you might have an observer opening the box um, and that observer would be in a mixture of observing one version of the universe in which the cat is alive, another version in which the cat is dead, and the observer, the two branches of the observer would go on, um, in one case, mourning the cat, and the other case, being happy that the cat was spared and not know about each other. So that's the Everett solution to the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. So soon thereafter, uh, Hugh Everett came up with this idea Niels Bohr visited Princeton, and Hugh Everett tried to convince him to abandon the idea of human-caused quantum measurement. And at, Niels Bohr at that time was very famous. He was practically royalty in Denmark. He was visited by Queen Elizabeth II and, you know, had his own uh, palace, essentially, a, a really nice mansion. Uh, funded by the Carlsberg Brewery. Uh, so he was, you know, really, um, you know, very much established. And he wouldn't really listen to a young upstart like Hugh Everett. Um, so he never really gave Everett the time of day. And Wheeler was very frustrated because Wheeler liked Everett's idea, but he was also admired Niels Bohr and kept trying to get Niels Bohr to, e to think about Everett's idea because Wheeler thought it was kind of neat, a neat idea, but Bohr wouldn't consider it. Even a few years later, Everett visited Bohr in Denmark and still Bohr would not even listen to the idea. So Everett kind of gave up on, on it eventually and um, went into the military instead. Now, before that, before Everett gave up, um, Wheeler sent a copy of Everett's paper to physicist Bryce DeWitt, who's a gravitational physicist, and um, De DeWitt and his um, wife, uh, Cecile DeWitt Moret, organized a conference in Chapel Hill. And Everett wasn't at the conference, but Wheeler thought it, the paper would go well in the conference proceedings. So he sent the paper to Bryce DeWitt. And Bryce DeWitt at first was incredulous. He said, this is strange. I, how could reality split? You know, I don't feel any splitting. You know, that's not part of my day. I wake up and I brush my teeth, have breakfast, but splitting, no, that's not something that's part of my day. And Everett responded back, well, look at Copernicus. He said that the earth is turning and Galileo also said the earth is turning, but we don't really feel the earth turning, but yet we know it turns. And DeWitt said, touche, young man, you're absolutely right. This could happen and we don't know about it. And it could be just happening as part of a natural quantum process. And because we don't experience it doesn't mean that it doesn't, um, doesn't happen. So um, he, uh, DeWitt eventually renamed the idea and popularized it. He called it, at first, the many universes interpretation of quantum mechanics, which later became the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And that's the name that kind of stuck and became popular. Now, DeWitt published a, a popular article in Physics Today around 1970 with the Everett idea. And um, 
One of the people who read the article was Brandon Carter, who is an Australian physicist who was working at the time in Cambridge University. Um, Carter's still around. He's he, he just turned 80 rather recently. Um, and he asked the question, um, why is our part of the universe or our entire universe special? And he thought that the idea of many universes and a selection process, which he called the anthropic principle, but we we'll be a way of explaining certain constants in the universe that seem what we call fine-tuned, meaning they have to have certain values or else um, life will not be possible. So there are certain properties of the universe that seem auspicious. For example, the strength of gravity, known as the gravitational constant. If the strength of gravity was much stronger, then the universe might have collapsed very early on in its history. So you have a big bang, you have strong gravity, and then just like throwing a ball up in the air, it would have come down to the ground rather quickly, and then the universe would have collapsed, and then there would be no galaxies, no stars, no planets, no life. Um, on the other hand, if gravitational constant was much weaker, then maybe what we call dark energy would have been stronger in the beginning, and there wouldn't have been the possibility of star formation or planet formation because there wouldn't have been any gravitational clumping. So we also wouldn't have had stars, planets, and life. So gravitational constant is just in the right range for, um, for galaxies, stars, planets, and life. Um, similarly, on a small scale, the strong nuclear force, if that were weaker, and that's the force that holds atomic nuclei together, if that were weaker, then you wouldn't have had um, elements higher than hydrogen. And even if it were very slightly weaker, um, there's a barrier in the ladder of building up um, different nuclei, starting from hydrogen to helium, all the way up to uh, eventually uranium, which are the natural elements. Um, and the early, um, the, the early uh, elements, the smallest elements, um, are built up in stars. And if the strong nuclear force were weaker, or if other things were different, carbon wouldn't have uh, been able to have been created. So carbon is very hard to produce. You, you actually need the uh, very dense inner core of cores of collapsing st stars, so dying stars, very, very hot temperatures. And you also need auspicious uh, rules in quantum mechanics and, and so forth. And it seems very, very fine-tuned. And as uh, as astrophysicist Fred Hoyle pointed out, it just seems uh, very, uh, very lucky coincidence that carbon was created because otherwise life would have been impossible. So the anthropic principle seem to explain also um, the fact that our universe is very smooth and um, very even in terms of galaxy numbers. And um, to say more about the anthropic principle, um, so let me go back a slide, um, or two slides. It says that the fact that we're here means that we are... Um, that we were part of an ensemble of universes and um, we're one of many universes and we happen to be in the best of all possible universes for life. And then if you look at other universes, their constants might be very, very different. So that's, that's where the multiverse idea comes in. And Carter said in his paper that maybe the many worlds interpretation will be a way to produce such a multiverse. And then, um, and then have our universe being one of many. But um, shortly thereafter, 
um, in the early 80s, a different idea for trying to explain why the universe is like it, it is uh, came about. And that was due to people like Alan Guth, uh, Paul Steinhardt, Andre Linde. And that's called the inflationary model. And that says that to smooth out the universe, you need a period of ultra rapid expansion in the very, very early moments of the universe. So in this fledgling interval, right after the Big Bang, the universe, observable universe, went from something like subatomic size. So I'm talking about the observable universe today was once smaller than a proton and then suddenly expanded to the size of a baseball. Um, and then that baseball size very, very slowly grew over time over billions of years to be the size of the observable universe. So in 13.8 billion years, went from baseball size to something like uh, 40, 46 billion light years in radius. Um, so incredible growth, but it's also a very long time. But going from subatomic size to the size of a baseball in a fraction of a second is truly remarkable. But by stretching the universe so quickly, it explains the uniformity of the observable universe, the fact that it's so flat, and also the fact that if you look at galaxy counts in different sectors of the sky, you, they're pretty much on average the same. Of course, there are large formations like clusters, walls of galaxies, um, voids where there are fewer galaxies. But if you look at the very largest scale, we believe that the galaxy counts are pretty similar. Similarly, the temperature of space is pretty similar in all directions. So, um, so that's what inflation does. It also explains structure formation because it blows up random quantum fluctuations in the early universe into higher density seeds of stars and galaxies. So you have this quantum fluctuation that just emerges randomly in, in space, and then it blows up to something like the size of a pea, and you know that eventually coagulates with other things and you know merges with other bits and pieces of mass to form over time things like um, like stars. Um, so there are models for how inflation starts, and that also involves uh, quantum mechanics, involves the idea of a what's called a scalar field, which is which means an energy field that might um, that might have certain values in certain points in primordial space time. And um, if it has the right shape, um, the energy curve, for that region of space that sets off ultra rapid expansion, it's just an automatic process. So you, you have a part of space, the right energy profile, and then bam, the universe takes off and expands in an ultra rapid fashion. And that becomes a universe. But as Andre Linde and others showed, that could happen many, many places. And that leads to what's called eternal inflation, which is another type of multiverse, which is that you have all these bubble universes out there that the early universe is foamy. They have one bubble, another bubble. Some of these bubble universes blow up so quickly and that they, they couldn't possibly form structure. Some of them might, um, might fizzle out, recollapse. So you have all these different kinds of motions all these different kinds of expansion and possible contraction. And these are all different bubbles. And this is a, a type of multiverse that it's possible that we could detect. Not now, because the bubbles would be too large today for anyone to uh, contact them because they'd be way out of observ observability. But perhaps in the early universe, um, some bubbles collided with each other and created scars in the cosmic microwave background, which is 
the radiation that fills up all the space left over from the early universe. So we would see these as ring, ring-like scars, which would be due to the, um, the contact between two different bubble universes. So scientists have been looking for these scars using uh, various probes that were launched uh, in, in past decades, the WMAP probe and the Planck satellite, which mapped out what's called the baby picture of the universe, which is temperature fluctuations in the radio profile of the universe, indicating places of higher density, places of lower density. So it tells us a lot about the universe. And physicists have looked for star scars of collisions. So far, they haven't found anything significant, but perhaps future collections of data might reveal such scars. And one of the leading physicists in that area is Hiranya Perez uh, of the University of London, who's um, worked with collaborators such as Matthew Johnson to look for um, these scars, which would resemble rings in, um, in the profile, cosmic back, microwave background profile. Another area multiverse theories emerge is string theory. Now, string theory is the idea that instead of particles, that everything is fundamentally energetic strands. So um, we talk about particles being quarks, electrons as point particles. But if we try to come up with a theory of everything using point particles, the problem is um, when you try to model gravity, everything blows up mathematically. You can't find a solution. And that's because you have to divide by the size of these particles. And if the size is zero, infinitesimal, we would say, then you get infinite terms. But string theory gives you finite strands, finite sizes. So if you have to divide by their length, you get finite values. And string theory is very successful mathematically, but it has some very odd predictions. One of the predictions is that the universe is uh, at least 10 dimensional and possibly 11 dimensional. That's really odd because we only see three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. So where are all the other dimensions we might wonder? Well, early on in the history of unified field theories, um, Oscar Klein, Swedish physicist, came up with the idea of compactification, said, well, maybe there's all these other dimensions out there but they're curled up like rings or like balls into regions so tight that we can't possibly detect them. Um, so it's a little bit like an analogy is if you have a piece of spaghetti and you look at it really closely, dry spaghetti, you see that it has a, um, a cross section. It has a circle on one of the ends, circle on the other end, and then it's a line in between the two circles. But if you looked at a piece of spaghetti from a great distance, like if you're standing on top of a tall ladder, it would just look like a two-dimensional line. You wouldn't see the third dimension, which would be the thickness of it. So similarly, perhaps the these higher dimensions uh, are undetectable because they're well, they're much, much smaller um, than we can detect and curled up into these rings or balls. And then later, string theorists realized that there are many, many, many ways to curl up or compactify strings and came up with a value. And these are called Kalabi Yao manifolds of. Uh, 10 to the 500 possibilities. So 10 followed by 500 zeros ways to curl up these higher dimensions. And each of them yields different physics, a different universe, different laws. And that's really very wild. 
the idea that string theory has 10 to the 500 possibilities. We have to narrow it down 10 to the 500 down to one. Um, so that's an area where some physicists said, hey, wait a minute, what if each of those is a different universe, but only a small subset of these universes are viable and all the others just don't work. Like the physics doesn't work, mathematics doesn't work. And maybe only one of those out of the 10 to the 500 is suitable for life. And that's why we're here. So using the anthropic principle to narrow down what's called a string landscape um, and saying, well, we're in the best of all possible um, regions of this vast sprint string landscape. So that's another use of the multiverse. And finally, um, a, an influential use of the multiverse is by Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg. And this was in the 1990s. Um, at that time, we um, there was a quantity called the cosmological constant. And we knew that it was either zero or very small. And, um, and if it was zero, you would have to say, well, maybe it's just not physics. But um, if it was very small, but non-zero, you have to explain why it was very small, but non-zero. And let me explain, first of all, what the cosmological constant is to explain why this is a mystery. Cosmological constant was introduced in 1917 by Albert Einstein when his original version of general relativity, uh, he solved it and it predicted that the universe would either expand or contract. And Einstein said, hey, wait a minute, that can't be right. You know, the stars move, but the universe itself is not going to move. That is a flaw in the theory. So he added a stabilizing term as a kind of a fudge factor. And he called that the cosmological constant. And that predicted a stable universe. But then in 1929, Edwin Hubble, um, using Mount Wilson Observatory, discovered um, that uh, galaxies are all receding from ours except nearby galaxies. And most scientists interpreted that as an expanding universe. Although strangely enough, Hubble himself did not believe that his results necessarily showed that the universe was expanding but everyone else believed that practically. And Einstein came to believe that the universe is expanding. So he dropped a cosmological term and he called it his greatest blunder. And here's a picture of Einstein uh, looking through the, um, the Hooker telescope at Mount Wilson and uh, you know, with Hubble and another astronomer, Walter Adams in the background. Now, we look uh, decades after that, 1998, uh, two teams of astronomers observed distant supernova and used them as, uh, as spinometers for their, um, you know, their energy properties showed their distance and their light profile showed their speed and used it to prove that the universe is accelerating its expansion. And... The cosmological constant is one way of modeling an accelerated expansion. Although recent results, which are still being examined, say, well, maybe it's not so constant after all. Maybe the universe is accelerating differently in different directions, which would be really interesting. But the simplest model of acceleration, or dark energy as it's called, is to have a cosmological constant. Now, the cosmological constant would... Um, give you uh, the red line, which is uh, speeding up in its expansion versus the other lines, which is what we used to believe, which is that expansion would slow down and maybe even reverse itself. Now, quantum theory also predicts a cosmological constant by adding up using quantum field theory um, all the energy in the universe due to what's called vacuum energy, which is particles coming in and out of empty space. And that gives you a value of the cosmological constant, which is an enormous one. 
But astronomy says if there's a cosmological constant, it has to be small. So Weinberg proposed the idea of a multiverse and said, well, maybe there's all these universes out there and each has its own cosmological constant and they vary in range. Most of them are real, are huge. And then the universes with huge cosmological constants would never coagulate into um, structures because uh, gravity could never compete with this anti-gravity term. Cosmological constant acts as a kind of anti-gravity, but a universe with a small cosmological constant would work out and create stars and galaxies and so forth and life. And that's why we're, we, we're in a universe with a small cosmological constant because we're here. Once again, another variation of the anthropic principle. And his argument was pretty compelling. And uh, he did a calculation for what the cosmological constant could be, which came out, um, you know, a reasonably small value. So we are in, according to Weinberg, a tiny fraction, an outlier universe with a very small cosmological constant. And that would allow for gravitational clumping, resulting in stars, galaxies, planets, and ultimately life as we know it. So the multiverse will be used to explain why we are here. So in conclusion, multiverses in fiction and science are very different. There are many types of scientific multiverses, going back to the many worlds interpretation of Hugh Everett, the anthropic principle of Brandon Carter, eternal inflation of Andre Linde, who's currently at Stanford, um, string theory with its string landscape, and finally, the idea of a various cosmological constants, another kind of landscape, um, to explain why the cosmological constant is so small. So a lot of these do depend on the idea of the anthropic principle, um, you know, s sorting out the multiverse and filtering out universes which are non-viable. So for more about the multiverse, this is my book. There's a website associated with it. And the book is out um, everywhere online bookstores. You can think about supporting your local independent bookstore, picking up a copy there, or you can buy the book online or from a chain bookstore. So I'm going to stop here and I can answer any questions you all have. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Halpern. I think all our minds are swimming with this wonderful history that you, you showed us. Um, and uh, indeed, now we are going to have a question period. Let me remind everyone that if you want to ask a question, you email the question to astronomy at foothill.edu. And uh, the question period is going to involve all the questions that we've been receiving uh, throughout the program. And to monitor and introduce the questions, it's my pleasure now to present Professor Jeff Matthews, who is the astronomy professor here at Foothill College, where the lectures originate. And I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Matthews, uh, thanking Dr. Halpern again for a wonderful talk. Uh, Jeff Matthews, over to you. Thank you, Andy. And uh, thank you, um... Uh, also, Dr. Halpern for speaking with us this evening. Really appreciate it. And so um, I will be, I've been uh, reading the questions as they come in. I've tried to organize them a little bit. So I'll try to uh, kind of group the, group the questions that have come in. Um, a couple of people have asked questions kind of along the lines of, um, isn't the anthropic principle a, a just because argument? Uh, so a couple of people seem to be, uh, you know, not not satisfied with uh, with the anthropic principle. Well, it's 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 a little bit controversial because um, it uses a philosophical argument um, to say, well, 
this is this is kind of a filter for sorting out universes using this philosophical argument. Well, some universes can support life, some can't support life, but others, for example, Roger Penrose doesn't think it's it's a powerful enough filter to really do any sorting. And uh, with the just because argument, people say, well, okay, it, it just because there's life doesn't really mean we should have any suppositions about about the universe and we really don't know what what kinds of life are out there and we really don't know what you need to form life you know maybe as as fred hoyle the the astronomer and physicist once uh wrote in science fiction you could have life as an energy cloud or you know you can have all forms of life so maybe if gravity was much stronger um you might not have structures but you might have somehow some other form of life so i can kind of see that and brandon carter kind of anticipated such um qualms in his paper because he said look be better to come up with a dynamic argument but he basically proposed the anthropic principle as kind of a counterpoint to what's called the copernican principle and uh the idea that we're we're average so copernican principle says look, you know, Earth is completely in an average place in the universe. And, you know, we must be an average place in our galaxy, an average place in, in space. And Brandon Carter say, wait a minute, you know, there are things that, that must be special about us. At the very least, we, we couldn't be in the center of the galaxy because, you know, you have these massive stars, enormous amounts of energy uh, being released um, from, you know, accretion of black holes and things like that. So um, we really need to be in the periphery of our galaxy and we need to be in a Goldilocks zone, as, it called, as it's called, of our solar system. We couldn't be really close to our star, couldn't be far away. So he said, look, we need to be able to um, sort out things based upon whether the scientific model supports life or doesn't support life. And then he extended that to constants of the universe. So, but he said, look, if you can come up with a dynamic model, like there are reasons, for example, uh, that stars have a certain size uh, because of a balance between their nuclear furnaces and uh, gravitational pressure and so forth. And it, uh, I think it's called the G genes mass and the genes radius and so forth. And that the, these are come out of physics, the laws of physics, they don't have anything to do with whether or not there's life near the star or not. So, and he recognized that that's a better argument if you can do it, but he also said there's room for anthropic arguments in terms of trying to, you know, filter things out. Got it. Got it. So just the idea that if if things hadn't worked out, we wouldn't be here to discuss it in the first place. That's right. So um, so a couple of questions have come in um, asking, you know, zooming in on the inflation idea. Uh, so one of them is that uh, if the inflationary theory is correct and the expansion of the early universe exceeded light speed, wouldn't an infinite amount of energy have been required? And I think that this is tying to the idea that uh, you know you need more and more energy as you're getting close, you know, for things to be moving faster and faster, closer to the speed of light. Well, interestingly enough, um, general relativity does not strictly obey the um, the classical law of conservation of energy. So, in a way, you can produce something from nothing, and that's that's rather surprising. But um, Einstein intended. E equals mc squared to apply within the fabric of the universe and uh, science has showed that um you know that if you have um you know processes that happen in stars or in planets like locally you have this balance between energy and mass or conservation of energy if mass doesn't change but that does not apply to the accelerated expansion of the universe so as the universe is expanding, 
it's it's basically creating more and more gravitational energy out of nothing and that's just it's part of part of science part of cosmology it's not that there's some kind of wellspring somewhere of energy that's drawing upon it's just part of the in prediction of general relativity is that you have this uh, expansion under certain circumstances. So here, just sort of tacking on my own question on, on what you said there. So, so like this additional energy is just a property of the space itself that's being produced by the expansion. Uh, yes. So, so basically um, space time um, under certain circumstances uh, expands and that's not driven by that that itself is not driven by energy it could be driven by by geometry and just you know just you, you can even have as de sitter showed willem de sitter showed you can have a perfectly empty universe with no matter or energy in it and space time would could still expand and space would expand over time but um the fact is uh, that if you if you change the rate of expansion suddenly, which is which is where inflation comes in, so inflation has this this energy field which seeds the expansion. So it's it doesn't fuel the expansion; it seeds the expansion because um, in Einstein's general theory of relativity, you have two sides of the equation, and if you have energy in one side of the equation. And if you have a certain form of energy, it will lead to exponential expansion. So then you have this energy field, it causes exponential expansion, but then the energy field drops off at some point and goes to zero and then becomes, we say, goes from a false vacuum to the true vacuum. And then um, once that happens, the expansion, the inflationary expansion suddenly shifts into slow, very much slower expansion. And just like a crash, like a train crash or something like that, if a train crashes, it generates an enormous amount of heat. The crashing of the universe, so to speak, when it goes from an enormous expansion to a very slow expansion, releases a huge amount of gravitational energy. And that turns into basically all the particles we see today. So. So energy is released out of nothing. So you have this, you start with this very, very small amount of energy that triggers the exponential expansion and that blows everything up. Then once that stops, you have an enormous release of energy, much, much, much greater than the original amount of energy. So you're basically creating energy out of virtually nothing. Okay. I know it's a little mind, so mind blowing. So, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. It's a little counter to sort of, you know, we all sort of learn in school, right? You know, energy can't be created or destroyed; just change from one form to another. It's yeah. Sort of one of the one of like these foundational things we learn in science classes. Yeah, there should be a little asterisk next to it and <laughs> a footnote that says, "Unless you're the universe." <laughs> nice, nice. Um, I'll remember that asterisk in my own teaching in the future. Um, so. Got a question about um, you know the idea of the yeah I think this is about sort of the the idea of there being different bubbles where kind of the rules are different. Uh, could a nearby universe with a big cosmological constant run over our universe? Uh, well, if you believe in the bubble idea, bubbles could crash, but um, but at the same time, you know, once these bubbles expand, really really large the crashing would occur in the periphery of the bubble bubble and it'll be unclear if it could really affect us but if the crash occurred early on of course you know uh information or material could have been exchanged early on um, but that wouldn't affect us now so i wouldn't really worry about another if you believe in internal inflation another universe crashing into ours now you might want to worry about an energy field arising that causes um you know bubble universe to emerge in our vicinity but that would 
that would basically push our part of the universe uh, away from that. So once again, uh, it's not something I would stay up night, you know, late at night worrying about, you know, uh, 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 other bubble universes affecting ours. Got it. Okay, so I've got a few questions, few more questions here about, uh, you know, some kind of some of the foundational stuff that you brought up along the way. Um, so one of these is a question: uh, Why, why is it that the uh, so why is it that the uniformity requires inflation? Wouldn't things be the same everywhere because the rules are the same everywhere? Well, so basically, um, we need uh, a time when, if we look at all the galaxies in all sky directions, and we look at all the points in all sky directions which have a certain temperature, we would need a time when, if you reversed the history of the universe, everything was in thermal contact. So everything was close to the same temperature. Um, um, and that's because uh, early in the universe, um, the universe was opaque. So you, you had these particles in this kind of a soup of particles and you had electrons and uh, photons uh, kind of having a ricochet of particles between them and nothing was really uh, released until atom, neutral atoms formed. And that's called the age of recombination. And then um, suddenly you have these neutral atoms out there and, and the photons are released. And you want at that time, um, the universe to be pretty uniform at temperature at that time, because if the universe wasn't uniform in temperature at that time, then it, would, then it wouldn't be uniform in temperature today. And you would have a very different picture of the cosmic microwave background. You'd you'd see, you know, uh, larger temperatures in one sky direction, smaller temperatures in the other sky direction. So then, to kind of explain um, why the universe with uniform temperature in the time of recombination, you have to imagine that everything was once super super close together, and that's where inflation comes in. The idea that the universe was once the observable universe was once so close that pretty much the temperatures equalized automatically. And then it blew up into this, you know, ball the size of a baseball. And it still, it blew up so quickly that still temperatures were pretty much the same in all directions. So it's, it's really hard to get that without some kind of stretching or mixing process. Got it. So if, if things had been really far apart from each other, then they could have gotten much more different than we see them being That's today. Right. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And so then um, one last question here. Um, and this was somebody kind of getting at the, really kind of the philosophy of the Hilbert space and the collapse idea. Um, and they're basically asking, well, I'll just give their phrasing. Why would anybody believe believe an idea that said humans are special? Well, we're special to us, so um, we're we're um, special in terms of, as far as we know, we're the only um, sentient entities, conscious entities. Um, you know, you know, people, of course, um, SETI and so forth, are trying to look for signals from other from other civilizations. And a lot of us believe that they're out there, but currently um, we're special because we're the only um, self-aware entities out there. Now, of course, once, uh, once there is contact, we might have a very different picture of life. We might say, well, life is less special than we thought. Or we might say, well, life is more special than we thought. So we really don't know until we make contact with other, um, other uh, in, uh, interstellar or, or uh, galactic civilizations. All right. Well, with on that large note, let I want to thank you again for a wonderful introduction and recommend that people who want to know more 
Uh, please look for your book, The Allure of the Multiverse. Uh, thank you, Dr. Halpern, for being with us. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure being as part of your series. Great. Let me remind everyone, if you if this is the first of the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures that you tuned in, that we do have our uh, regular YouTube channel, and we urge you to like and subscribe to that channel. And if you want to be notified of future lectures, please hit the bell symbol. If you're listening to us as a podcast, these lectures are made available as podcasts and can be accessed on all the major podcast services. We will be back in May with another lecture in the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures. And until then, uh, I, I always like to close with the idea that uh, astronomy is looking up. Thank you very much.